species on the one planet we know where it happened. I would expect to see it as a multiple parallel trend pervading the history of life, and I don't. I see it as the curious, albeit glorious and wondrous invention of one peculiar little lineage. That, to me, does not speak to inevitability. Except uh, people of his... Well, lots of others, too, would say uh, these things do... Uh, I mean, the eye has evolved many times. Not every eye on an insect or a human or a mouse uh, comes from the same original accident. There have been many starts toward that end. Well, right? it's not that simple, Chris. The structures that are capable of some form of light perception, and often it's not the ability to form an image, it's just light-sensitive cells, right. have evolved 40 to 60 times i think you have a basic substrate of uh, transparent proteins that can play this role however the lens eye which has evolved in six different groups of animals in fact though it used to be cited as a standard example just as you said of independent utterly independent evolutionary events which therefore indicate a kind of inevitability given a substrate of possibility which evolution has to give you turns out that's not strictly true hmm. the eye of the squid and the human which are so very similar they are not entirely the same of course they're not they're built of different body tissues that part of the argument is right but one of the most fascinating discoveries of the last 20 years is that there are shared genetic pathways even though these groups have been separate for more than 500 million years there are shared mm -hmm. genetic pathways in the development of eyes in mollusks the squid eye in vertebrates in insects which have a very different kind of multiple lens eye in fact the squid gene and the human gene when applied to the leg of a fly will build a fly's eye on its leg <laughs> so <laughs> that in fact there is this enormous genetic retention of a common potentiality it's not just convergence showing the inevitability of this higher form of perception 1-800-423-8255 makes the connection with the paleontologist and the writer Stephen Jay Gould on the occasion of his 300th and final monthly essay in Natural History magazine Michael is on the line yes and you know would that cultural evolution were directional, but I think we've got a case of regression to the mean. Um, millions of children are being educated solely in creationism this year and in the, the coming years, and, uh, well, our national government is now completely in the hands of people who at least publicly espouse at least sympathy for anti-evolutionary ideas and whose best friends are rabidly. Uh, creationist and you know, I think would rather uh, have that taught alone. Um, I, I'm just wondering how do we culturally cope with this divide and um, you know, who do you think will be showing up in our universities in 15 years? I'm not quite as pessimistic as you. I'm very saddened by the whole issue. First of all, I think some of the noises that politicians make from our current president-elect to Mr. Reagan, even to Al Gore, I'm sorry to say, on one occasion, though he knows better, I think they are just political noises to placate a constituency. I know, for example, that Ronald Reagan was a great believer in and fascinated by human evolution, though he had a constituency that uh, led him to make other noises at certain times, and I trust the same is so with our current president-elect. I think they understand that evolution is factually so. There may be some political benefits in saying otherwise. But I do put a great deal of trust in, in our Constitution, maybe a little less in our Supreme Court over the last couple of days. But at least so far, given the First Amendment and its guaranteed protections of separation of church and state, we have never lost a major court case on the teaching of evolution and attempts to force creationism, which is nothing more than a minority among religious folks, very uh, but he has literalist an viewpoint. So I think evolution will continue to be taught. You're right. The question is right that millions of people, despite the fact that we win our court victories in the public schools, are being taught in homes and private schools the opposite, and that's very sad. I certainly agree with the caller. But will the next so crop of college students come uh, to, you know, freshman year with a different disposition? I don't think so, Chris. I think most will be still coming through the public school system. We continue to win our cases in the public school system. We just defeated the uh, school board of the state of Kansas, which had removed evolution as a necessarily taught subject. They didn't 
ban it, but they took it out of the required teaching of the state curriculum. We've beat them, and that will be back in the state curriculum as soon as the new school board be, went, uh, co- constitutes itself Michael. this fall. So I'm not totally pessimistic, but I certainly share the caller's deep concerns on those issues. Michael, do you want to come back? Well, you know, it, to it maybe nasty to characterize them this way, but the worst are filled with a passionate intensity. Every day on a, a local Christian radio outlet in the Boston area, you can hear at least one sustained, uh, generally Philip Johnson-esque attack on uh, evolution, on on the sort of thing that people are, are trained in apologetics to, to give uh, simple, flawed arguments against say, teaching on the high school biology level, which is often not very good. It's often a blind recitation of facts, which can be, um, which can be met with a blind recitation of factoids. It's a political battle, and we'll just have to beat them. We have so far prevailed, and I'm optimistic that we'll continue to do so. I see no trends that we won't. Again, I share your concerns. I totally agree that it's a battle that has to be fought every day that can't possibly be relaxed and that the forces on the other side are always there and at the ready, but I don't see any reason to be pessimistic. Psychological evolution. Yeah, but none of that is, is biological evolution. There's been no biological change in 100 years. That, that, that is right. Yeah, I think, alteration. Uh, so to speak, I think the software, that is the mind, has evolved pretty rapidly. That's and changed. It's, uh, yeah, because I think, the, 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 and now, for instance, if you look at the world today, we are interacting with a variety of information appliances and even machines, which the kind of stimuli which the human uh, mind has not processed, say, even 300 or 400 years back. Uh, so I, I would like to get your impressions on how, how, how this is going to be in the years to come. Any speculations? I would have welcome some speculations. No, there. that's how, how, long, how far out a prediction would you like, mine? Say, I'm not going to be able to give one anyway. No, those, that's the great question. And unfortunately, it's exactly where evolutionary biology can't help very much <laughs> because all of this immense change and danger and new context is without any input from my field of evolutionary biology. That is, evolutionary biology made us homo sapiens who we are. But during the last hundred years, there's been no genetic or evolutionary change in human nature, we are dealing with this new technological situation with the exact same evolutionary tools we had when we painted those caves 30,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, therefore, there's going to be much enlightenment from the evolutionary science of how genetic change comes about, because that's not what we need, and that's not what's causing our current dilemmas. That's why I don't even like to use the phrase cultural evolution. I always talk about cultural change, because I think the disanalogies are greater than the analogies. If you're talking about cultural change and you want a biological metaphor, I think epidemic is much better than evolution. one eight hundred four two three eight two five five makes the Stephen J. Gould connection. Mike is calling from Warwick, Rhode Island. Yeah, hi, Professor Gould. Um, hi. Apparently, yeah, you know, everybody always thought that life formed on pools of water on, on the surface, but recently, you know, these hot smokers way under, under the ocean, thousands of feet under the ocean, had a totally different thing where, where the chemistry was by hydrogen sulfide and heat and, and complete darkness and these huge tube worms formed. And I really wanted to know what, what, you know, what you think, if that's possible, that life actually, you know, formed there as opposed on the surface. And apparently um, this moon of Jupiter, uh, Europa, has, has a water ocean as big as Earth or maybe bigger and, you know, it's geothermal activity, so the same kind of activity could have happened there. Yeah, I don't, first of all, I don't think the tube worms have much, they're Paganoferans, they're members of a group that involved elsewhere, we know them well. The main point about the so-called smokers is it shows there's more than one environment on the current Earth, which is capable or is of the right set of conditions for what could have marked the origin of life billions of years ago. And I think that's very interesting. And that does, as you correctly point out, tie into much more optimism than we had even 10 years ago Mm. for the possibility at least of life of bacterial level, when you're talking about tube worms, which are complicated creatures, evolving in other parts of the solar system. Uh, You know, there are bacteria living on the Earth, we now understand, up to a couple miles down under the Earth's surface in poor spaces and rocks through which water and other fluids can percolate. Uh, They're 
was water on Mars for the first billion years of its history. There may still be, well, there still is water on the ice caps, a little bit or a little bit of fluid, but underneath the frozen permafrost, I, there may yet be life of bacterial level on Mars. I think it's a long shot. You mentioned Europa. So once you understand the extreme environments in which life at bacterial level can survive, it gives you a lot more optimism, not for little green men, but for the possibility that we may yet even discover life of bacterial level in our own solar system. Optimism, you say. Uh, would it be good news, Steve Gould, to find that life elsewhere? It would be enormously good news, just because it would be so interesting. It would be the most interesting thing we ever found out, Chris. You see, we don't. all life on Earth shares this immensely common biochemistry. All has DNA and RNA. It all uses ATP for energy storage. And the great question is, do we share those features because that's the only way it could happen? Mm. Or do we share it by the accident that we're all descendants of one common ancestor on a single tree of life? The only way to answer that is to find life elsewhere and see whether it's the same or different.